Hello, and welcome back to round three of Braille Literacy um, Canada Symposium. And it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Michael Hudson. And Michael is joining us from Lexington, Kentucky. Wow, that's amazing. So far away. We're so pleased you're here, Michael. Michael uh, has a degree in history from uh, both the Kentucky Wesleyan College and the University of Delaware. And I love museums, Michael. I am so excited to learn more about the American Printing House for the Blind Museum. They truly are an extension of our classrooms and we're really looking forward to hearing more about the very essence and the beginnings of Braille and how it's evolved in not only your country and our country, but just around the world. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. And it's all yours. Okay, thank you. You can hear me okay, right? Okay, so, um, well, we only have 30 minutes. Well, I'm gonna talk for 30 minutes and then we'll have about 15 minutes of questions. So uh, bear in mind that we have hundreds and hundreds of years of history here uh, at the Museum of the American Printing House for the Blind. So I'm only gonna be able to skate around, okay? So for those of you that can't, uh, can't see the screen, I just want you to know what's behind me is my office, which in itself is a museum. Uh, uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff that I, we're working on at this time. Um, so uh, pardon the clutter uh, of, of the office behind me. So I want to give you a little history of the museum. So the printing house obviously is the oldest and largest manufacturer of uh, products, educational products for people who are blind or visually impaired in Certainly in the United States, it's the largest in the world and it was founded in 1858. And so uh, the museum was opened in 1994. So we have been around what, 26, 27 years, something like that. And um, in that time, we have grown from a museum that really concentrated really heavily on um, the history of the printing house and how we have manufactured books and other educational aids um, and the history of the historic residential schools. That's pretty, that was pretty much what we were about when we first started. But since then we have collected so many other large and important collections and added them to our permanent collection and uh, made collaborative agreements with uh, the American Foundation for the Blind and added amazing stuff there. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but, but really today, the collection of the Museum of the Printing House is probably the finest uh, collection of materials that document the history of, of education and rehabilitation for people that are blind or visually impaired, I think, in the world. Um, and we're just gonna kind of talk a little bit about what we have. When you first get off the elevator in, uh, in the museum, the first thing that you encounter is a series of relief plaques that are on the wall. They're basically reproductions of various forms of early writing. You see uh, Sumerian cuneiform. You see Egyptian hieroglyphics. You see um, Assyrian carvings from monuments. You see uh, carvings from Greek sculpture. Um, and you also see uh, uh, Western uh, pieces from the Incans and the Mayans, okay? Now, what do all these things have in common? They're all tactile. So if the Pharaoh or, the, or King Hammurabi in the Middle East or the God King down in, in uh, Mexico City had decided that it was to, in their interest to have their blind or visually impaired citizens be able to read it was all possible from the very beginning of writing, right? But of course, that's not what happened, right? Nobody who was blind was allowed to learn to read. In fact, most people weren't allowed to learn to read, right? If you were a young lady or if your skin wasn't the right color, or you didn't come from the right social caste or the right economic class, you didn't get to learn, right? Education was rationed, right? And so our museum is really about a, an entirely different kind of thinking that starts in France, really, for, for all intents and purposes during the Enlightenment. This idea that one, 
it was possible to teach people who were blind or visually impaired how to read and then how to learn and how to do all kinds of things. Uh, that was that that was even possible was was a revelation to to most people. And in fact, folks, if we have to admit it, it's a revelation to lots of people even today. But um, the and then and then the second thing is that uh, not only is it possible, but if you're going to do it, you're going to need to adapt your materials, right? You're going to need to have accommodations. But that with those accommodations and with those adapted materials, that people who are blind or visually impaired can aspire to be anything that they want to be. Um, that all the tool that the tools they have to have the tools, and without the tools, probably it's going to be a lot harder to accomplish things. Now there are all kinds of historical examples of people like the English mathematician Nicholas Saunderson or the uh, Egyptian scholar um, uh, whose name right now escapes me. Anyways, uh, who learned who taught himself how to read and became a librarian in the in in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, there is examples of, of people who overcame all these obstacles, but um, in general, it's once that we start manufacturing things specifically for folks that are blind that um, really it becomes possible for anybody to achieve things and you don't necessarily have to be a genius. So once you walk through that entryway, uh, you come into uh, the first of two galleries that we have here at the printing house. The first one is what we call history in the making the exhibit is history in the making and it's in what we call the 1883 gallery because it is in the 1883 building which was the first structure built here um, on our current campus at the American Printing House for the Blind. And this exhibit pretty much takes you around the room and you explore decade by decade the history of the printing house and what we were what we were working on, what we were doing. I'm going to give you a little capsule uh, version of that but um, there was a guy named Dempsey Sherrod, who was uh, a guy who was blind or visually impaired and had graduated from the uh, Mississippi School for the Blind. And uh, he, he, he gets out, they've taught him how to read, but he's very disappointed that there are so few books available in a tactile format. Uh, in the United States at that point, it was in raised letters. Uh, there are very few books for him to read, and he thought what we really need in this country is a central printing house that will mass produce books for blind readers. And so Sherrod, uh, in the years before the Civil War, uh, starts traveling all around the South by train and by boat and by wagon and by foot, you know, not, travel was not easy for anybody, but it was even more difficult, obviously, for somebody who was blind or visually impaired during those days. But he travels all around, goes to all the state legislatures, uh, starts in Mississippi and gets a charter in the Mississippi legislature that passes in November of, of uh, 1857 that creates this thing that Dempsey Sherrod had envisioned called the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, and eventually he got to Kentucky and uh, in uh, January of 1858, he got the Kentucky legislature to also charter this uh, this American Printing House for the Blind to be located in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, why in Louisville? The truth is we don't really know. There's no smoking gun from a documentary perspective as to why they chose Louisville. Um, we know that Louisville in uh, 1858 was the 16th largest city in the United States. It was a large Western city and it was located on the most important transportation route in the American West at that time, which was the Ohio River. Uh, you come down the Ohio, you go down the Mississippi, connects uh, New Orleans, and then now you're in con connection with the world. And so for a guy from Mississippi, Louisville was an important city and many things came down the river to Mississippi from Louisville. And so that's why we think that they, they put that there. There was also a new railroad there. The LNN Railroad had just built some tracks, you know, 60 miles or so of track out of Louisville. And there were major important roads, uh, very poor roads by today's standards, but by their uh, uh, standards of those days, there were important national roads that went through Louisville. So that's why we're here. Now, Sherrod was a bit of a flim flam man unfortunately and although he was a, a, a visionary and he and he came up with this idea of the of the uh, printing house he also uh, tended to pocket a lot of the money that he raised for the american printing house for the bond for himself uh, and so uh soon after the uh 
the uh, Civil War uh, started in 1861, of course. Uh, the printing house was cut off from um, a lot of the southern states that were the source of its funding. And so not a lot happened during these, this period. They did manage to order a, uh, the first press um, and they ordered it from a man named uh, Stephen P. Ruggles, who was a famous press designer. And he had designed the printing press that uh, the Perkins School for the Blind in Boston was using to make its beautiful embossed books. And Ruggles made a press for the, for the printing house, but it didn't actually arrive until after the Civil War was over. So our first experiments in embossing raised letter books didn't happen until 1866. And we don't think that our, the, really the first complete book uh, occurred until 1869. Um, but these books were of extremely high quality. Uh, the, the, the font used was uh, called Boston Line Letter. It was a, a raised letter font that Samuel Gridley Howe had invented in, uh, in uh, Boston at Perkins. And um, but they were very expensive, very time consuming to make. They made these books in very small uh, editions of only about 400 uh, copies. And so it was only a few states that were able to send money to the printing house. Seven states uh, uh, kind of started sending money annually to the printing house. And so the kids in their states got the books from the printing house. So there was this realization for the first 25 years of the printing house's existence, really, that we were making great books, high quality books, but no one could afford to buy them. And certainly couldn't do it without government funding. So in 1879, um, led by uh, a Kentucky congressman named Albert Willis, but with a lot of support from historic residential schools, a bill was written by uh, the chair of the board of the printing house a guy named uh, William Fontaine Bullock, uh, who also, by the way, created the public school system in the state of Kentucky. And by the way, I can go on and on with these little details as long as you all have the patience for it. But um, Bullock writes the act to promote the education of the blind. In the United States, what that does is it creates this pot of money. And in 1879, it was a generous $10,000. Um, and then he created this system of ex officio trustees located all around the country. And if you've ever been to APH for one of our annual meetings in October, that meeting was created by the Act to Promote the Education of the Blind. It said that every year all the, the ex officio trustees would come together and, uh, and would guide the printing house in what products that they needed to make. And so, uh, so that provided money, that federal quota money was available for kids all around the United States to, to be able to buy books from the American Printing House for the Blind. And so that gave the printing house a tremendous amount of influence over what kinds of books were going to be used. Now, we had a publications committee that was made up of officials from the schools for the blind, and they were the ones that told us which books to make. So in 1871, the uh, few years earlier than that, the um, um, American Association of Instructors of the Blind had gotten together for only the second time. This was all the, you know, the superintendents and the heads and the teachers from the schools for the blind. And they uh, uh, just met for several days and hemmed and hawed about all kinds of issues. But one of the things that they met about was this guy, um, William B. Waite, had come with a proposition. And William B. Waite um, was a, uh, the superintendent of the New York um, School. Um, in New York City. And um, Waite uh, had seen the Braille code and had been impressed with it, but, um, and had been impressed with how, uh, how um, well that his students were able to, to, to remember things after they had written things using the Braille system. But, but Waite found some flaws, perceived flaws with the Braille system. He thought it was too bulky. Um, and, you know, think about it, Braille is bulky, even, um, even to this day, paper books of Braille with all the advances that we've made are, are fairly big and thick. So Waite had redesigned the, the dot code into what he called New York Point. And uh, this sets off what we call the War of the Dots, right, where New York Point and Braille and raised letters are going head to head. And we could talk about that for the rest of my time, and I'm not going to. But um, so what happens is that uh, the, the 
AAIB adopts New York Point. And so then the American Printing House sees that and go, okay, we'll make books in, in New York Point. And so if you could get free books in New York Point or you had to buy books in Braille, which system are you going to use? New York Point, right? So most of the schools for the blind uh, adopt New York Point. Uh, but then later on in the early 20th century, uh, you know, uh, there's a big knockdown drag out fight again between Braille and New York Point and Braille wins. And uh, then in the 18, I mean, the 19, uh, 30s, we start making talking books down in our talking book studio. And uh, in the 1940s, we start making uh, large type books. And, uh, and then in the 1950s, we create an educational research division and start making educational aids. And those are still the four big things that, 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 manu that we manufacture here, braille books, large type books, audio books, and educational aids. And educational aids are the, is the biggest by sales, what we do today. And so in this first exhibit in the 1883 gallery, we kind of walk you through that whole process and talk about what we were making and who was our superintendent and what kind of leaders did we have and, you know, how we're ta you know, how, how did tax policy on the federal level impact, you know, what, what the printing house was doing and all those sorts of things, bring it right up to the, to the present. So then we, we, once we leave that, uh, section, we walk into the second gallery. It's what we call the Callahan Gallery, and that's named for Marie and Eugene Callahan, were, who were a couple of folks who have no connection with the blindness field, but who uh, uh, donated generously to the printing house back in the 1990s, and so the gallery is named in their honor. And the, the, the uh, Callahan Gallery really starts with the first books for blind readers. That's that's Valentine Alwi's essay on education for the blind from 1786. Um, very significant, the very first raised letter book um, uh, that was made anywhere in the world that we know of. And um, it's from France that so many of these early ideas come from. Uh, not only uh, is Alwi that creates the first school for the blind in France, he also makes the first uh, raised letter book uh, uh, for blind readers in France. And uh, then then the rest of that display, that early books display is filled with other early books, like the first book in raised letters done in the United States, done in Philadelphia by Jacob Snyder in 1834. Uh, the first book done here at the printing house in 1869, which was John Gay's Fables, by John, uh, Fables for Children. Um, and then other books in other early tactile codes like moon type and Lucas type and, um, and other codes like that. Um, and all of these exhibits, by the way, are as accessible as we can make them. So where we can let you touch something like a Hall Braille writer, we have 15 Hall Braille writers. So we put one out where it can be touched. Um, we put them out where they can be touched, right? But wouldn't it be ironic if we had an, a museum that was full of artifacts made to be used with your hands and your ears and none of them could be touched or heard, right? So, but there are things in the collection that are so rare that we can't let anybody touch the real thing. For instance, the very next exhibit in, the, in our Callahan Gallery after first books is what we call the birth of Braille. And this tells the story of Louis Braille, you know, how he was blinded in his father's workshop and then got to go to Aoui's school in Paris and where he met uh, Charles Barbier, who had come up with a dot code and then in 1829 published the Braille code for the very first time. And the highlight of your trip to the Museum of the American Printing House of the Line is one of the super rare copies of the Presede, the method, right, which is the um, the publication of the first publication of the Braille Code by Louis Braille. Um, and all of you Braille nuts out there will be fascinated to see this book because uh, Louis uses both dots and dashes in the first edition in 1829. Uh, by 1837, when he comes up with the second edition, he has realized that as the finger goes across the page, the dashes don't really uh, aren't as crisp and clear as the dots. So he does away with the dashes. There are no contractions in his first edition. How about that? There are still some people out there who argue we should be using uncontracted Braille, right? I mean, if you're one of those fans, you could say, well, that's what Louis intended from the beginning. But in his second edition, he adds contractions, 10 or 11 of them, not many. But anyways, these are, this is, that's the, you know, the Presede is awesome. And, but we can't let you touch the Presede, right? 
It's too rare. There's only six copies of it that we know of anywhere in the world. And this is the only copy that's on public display. And so if we let people touch that, then obviously it would, it would wear out. We want these things to last as long as we can. So what we do is we reproduce a page from the, uh, from the uh, Presidio, I think it's page 14, where he introduces the alphabet. And by the way, the A that Louis invented in 1829 is, is M, N, O, and P, all the same as the Braille that we use today. Once you get out of first books, then we head into a little section on writing, uh, both writing with Braille slates and writing with uh, handwriting guides. And we must have probably a hundred different slate designs, uh, downward writing slates, upward writing slates, slates made out of nickel, silver, aluminum, uh, plastic, uh, uh, um, brass, uh, all kinds of slate designs, you know, uh, 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 desk slates, pocket slates, jiffy slates, uh, slates with dymo tape slots, um, and all kinds of stylus designs, uh, 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 different shaped handles, different materials, different shaped blades, upward writing, downward writing, again, with the styluses, full page uh, slates, didn't mention that. Um, and in this section, um, there's actually a case full of slates that we only open up for people that are blind or vision impaired to open up and explore. So uh, most museums, you know, everything is mostly locked away from people who are blind or vision impaired. In our museum, we have things that are locked away from people who are sighted and who are only available for people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, and then once you get out of slate writing, we get into handwriting. And of course, uh, before the invention of the typewriter, handwriting was a very important skill that all kids were taught at Schools for the Blind. So there's just uh, dozens of different uh, varieties of these kind of clipboard type arrangements with different ways to guide your pencil or your pen across uh, lines of your paper so that you write neatly um, and legibly. Um, and uh, so you can write letters if you're a businessman or you just want to write your mom. Um, you can write a, a nice neat hand. Now, once the typewriter gets invented in the 1860s, 1870s, uh, hand, uh, uh, handwriting guides for people who are blind and vision impaired begin to go away. Uh, so that I think in our catalog today, that we might have a signature guide and that's the only, that's the only guide we make. Um, and we also have some typewriters uh, in, a, in a display that's nearby. Uh, that were designed specifically for people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, and the advantage of a typewriter is obvious. Uh, once you, you get the touch typing down and you, you don't have to look at the keys, uh, you can type just as fast and as quickly and as accurately just about as someone who's, who's sighted. Um, and there have been some very interesting adaptations of typewriters uh, for people who are blind and visually impaired. One of which uh, is actually highlighted uh, this month, I think on our social media page is called an, uh, Todd's, um, Todd's improved Edison mimeograph typewriter, um, which was a real bear to use. You, you had to press the key down. So you want to make a capital M, you press the key down. Then there's a little wheel down at the bottom of the typewriter that you turn until you hear a click. Then you press a lever over here on the side, which raises a hammer, which hits a plunger, which pushes that type into the bottom of a piece of paper on the bottom of the paper roller. And in order to see what you typed, you have to take your hand and lift the paper roller off. It's hinged up and uh, it's a zoo. Uh, they didn't sell very well. Do you wonder why that is? <laughs> they didn't work too well. Uh, as you're walking around, the next uh, exhibit you encounter in the exhibit is Stevie Wonder's Piano from the Michigan School for the Blind. Uh, Stevie Wonder was a little kid in Detroit. He had a hit record, but it turns out he wasn't going to school. Instead, he was spending his time over at uh, Motown Records. His mom, Lula, was getting in trouble with the, with the truancy board. Some Louisville promoter, it's strange. I, I can't make this stuff up. This really happened. Uh, some Louisville promoter calls Barry Gordy at Motown Records and says, let's bring Stevie Wonder to Louisville for a concert. And, Gordy's like, oh, you know, we're in trouble here. We can't really do it. And this, this promoter goes, well, what if we hire this retired teacher from the Kentucky School for the Blind named Peggy Traub, and she travels around with Stevie Wonder uh, and tutors him while he's on the road? Ah, very Gordy's great idea. So they get this middle-aged white woman, Peggy Traub. She goes on like maybe one trip or two on the Motown Review bus and then decides that that's no place for her. 
so she puts him in touch with the Michigan School for the Blind, uh, the head, uh, uh, Robert Thompson, Thompson, I think it is, at Michigan School for the Blind, finds a recent grad of the, of the Michigan School for the Blind, Ted Hull. Ted Hull then travels around with Stevie Wonder all around the world for the next six years until Stevie graduates from college. And this piano is the stage piano from the Michigan School for the Blind. When Stevie was not on the road, Ted Hull and he lived at the Michigan School for the Blind and, and Stevie played many, many songs. And it's said that he, he composed My Cherie Amour on this piano. Uh, you know, he was in love with some kid there at the, at the school. I don't know if that's actually true, but I, I tell it all the time because I think it's a great story. Um, then as we go around, we come to our section on um, uh, talking books, where we talk about the beginning of the talking book program, uh, basically conceived almost entirely by this guy, Robert Irwin, the head of the uh, American Foundation for the Blind. He's the one who they invest the money to come up with a new record compound that's flexible enough to ship through the mail, uh, that has enough grooves on it, plays at 33 and a third RPM. So it's durable. It holds a lot of material. And then there's all kinds of players that we have in that exhibit. Uh, the first ones that were provided, people were hand cranked, I have no speaker that have a pair of, of headphones. Um, and that that's because, you know, in the 1930s, there were so many people in the United States that didn't have power right? No electricity. So you had to have a hand crank model all the way up to modern phonographs and then into cassettes and reel to reel. And then the modern, uh, of course, the flash drive units and all that stuff. Um, so I'm going to, I, I, you, as you can tell, there's not enough time for me to walk you through the entire museum. I'm looking at my time and I'm seeing that, of course, I've gotten a, a distracted with telling you a few stories. But so we have a section on geography that has uh, different early tactile maps, uh, tactile globes, uh, the big 30 inch relief globe that the American Printing House made in the 50s, 60s and 70s, and then other tactile maps from around the world. Uh, including hand carved wooden maps that we made here in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, we have a section on math um, that looks at all kinds of calculating devices like abacuses and Taylor slates and Cuba rhythms and uh, uh, various counting uh, uh, apparatus like that. We have a science section that looks at some of these really fascinating uh, early tactile graphics made by a guy named Martin Kuhns in Ilzac, Germany. Um, Ilzac today is in France, um, but um, uh, Kuhns had come up with this complicated way to carve uh, uh, all kinds of pictures out of wood, make a heavy mold, put it into a press, put some wet paper in there, crunch it down. And then once it came out of the press, you'd let it dry and then you would paint the, the animals. It has all kinds of different animals, shapes of, of, of fish and plants and animals. And then you would varnish them so that the graphic would stay nice and hard and you could read it, you know, explore it many times without flattening it out. We have an exhibit about the early schools for the blind. So the first three in the United States were Perkins and Overbrook and the New York Institute. Uh, I think Kentucky was sixth. We're pretty proud of that. Uh, in Kentucky, you, you say things a lot like the first fill in the blank west of the Appalachians, and that's that's us, Kentucky. Um, and um, we also have an exhibit on printing technology. So we talk about the early presses, the early stereograph machines, uh, and how uh, the printing house adapted first printing technology to emboss books in raised letters and braille and those sorts of things. And then how in the 50s and 60s, we worked with IBM to pioneer the use of computers to translate braille. Because uh, in the old days, you had a stereograph machine, it was kind of like a big braille writer, but instead of writing on paper, it writes on metal plates that you use in a press, right? And so an operator would sit there with a excuse me, a book stand, they'd have the print book there in front of them and they would literally be translating the book onto plates, one plate at a time. And of course, if the, if the, if the, if the book needed a thousand plates, you had to translate, you had to create a thousand printing plates. And so in the 50s and 60s, we worked with IBM to figure out a way to computerize that process. And so today for those books that we still make with printing plates, embossing plates, and we still do use some embossing plates for projects, those are all done with a, a computer to translate the book and then a plate embossing device to make the press. So we have an exhibit on that section. And then we have our Braille writer display. 
we have over 40 different braille writers from all over the world, starting with the historic 1892 Hall Braille Writer, the granddaddy of them all, the, the, the one that was invented by Frank Hall. And by the way, Frank Hall didn't mean to invent a Braille Writer. He invented, he meant to make a, uh, a New York Point Writer because the Illinois school was using New York Point. But when he and this machinist, this gunsmith in, in Jacksonville, Illinois, started out to mechanize New York Point, they discovered that it was really, it was much more, it was hard because New York Point doesn't take up the same amount of space every time, and Braille does. So instead of making a New York Point writer, he made a Braille writer with big consequences for the use of Braille in the United States. So um, anyways, we have all these Braille writers. They're in these special cases so that if you use your eyes, you can just look at them and marvel at, you know, how the Italians made a Braille writer and how the Japanese made a Braille writer and how the British made Braille writers. And they're, they're of all kinds of different shapes and sizes. You know, every kid that had a, every, un ki every kid, every uncle who had, a, who, who had a nephew or a niece who was in a school for the blind and look at what they were using was like, oh, I can, you know, I'm, I'm handy with tools. I can make something better than that. Until uh, 1951, when the Perkins Brailler is introduced, and the Perkins Brailler just drives every other Braille writer just about off the market. And APH knows because we have tried, <laughs> we have tried several times to come up with a with a new Braille writer, a nice lightweight, durable thing that would be available on federal quota, and. Uh, so far, it's a big nit, a big whiff. Uh, we have not managed to make one better than the Perkins Braille Writer. And to this day, more Perkins Braille Writers have been made than any other Braille Writer. All the other Braille Writers combined, all of them combined, more Perkins have been made than that because it's just a great machine, right? You can chalk an 18-wheeler with it and it still works. Um, and that, at 31 minutes, is your rapid fire. Uh, zippity dude I walk through the, the the printing house for the blind our museum and and here's the thing uh Larry Scootcon who was our longtime head of our technology products research area once told me when I first started here 15 years ago that a trip to the printing house is a mecca it's a mecca for anybody who is involved with uh education rehabilitation for people who are blind or visually impaired and I I feel that's very true and we just uh, have added we just made a, a deal with the American Foundation for the Blind uh and last January of 2020 myself and our archivist uh Justin Gardner traveled up to uh to New York and brought back the AFB Helen Keller archive so all of Helen's papers all of those possessions, her awards, her graduation gowns, her diplomas, her desk, um, uh, her documents, her letters, the, the early le letters that she wrote from Alabama, her, her passionate, uh, 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 you know, all her books, her articles, they're all here. Um, and uh, we're working on creating a, a new museum that we're going to open here in the next three to five years that's going to that's going to have give us the space to tell more of those stories. And there we go, Daphne, I turn it back to you. Michael, thank you so much. Now you're on. Uh, this is my bucket list. I, I'm got once the, the borders open, the flights are open. Wow, you have given us such an invitation. And I was just looking on your website. I love it that there's some virtual tours. We can maybe from the privacy of our own homes, just pop in and have a visit. Um, we put that in the chat to encourage people to go to visit you um, remotely, but thank you for providing this history and, and for the important work APH has for us in Canada, we would be lost without the resources and the the materials that are coming out and they're always coming out and and new programs it's yeah it's wonderful well, one of the threads i think that runs through uh the history is is this urge to have a unified english braille code yes. so yeah. that if if a book is translated in england or in australia or here yeah. or in canada that that book can be used anywhere in the English speaking world. And that's, that's been a long fight to tell you the truth. Yeah. It has been a yeah. long struggle. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, and who said Braille was boring? It's not. It's, I mean, we've got a war of a dots. We've got UEB. There's so it's much. a living it's like, code. Any, if, totally. for, any of your, for any of your folks out there that are going, ah, you know, they start, you know, complaining about UEB. 
the, yeah. the truth of the matter is that this discussion, you know, has been going on again and again and again because we adapt the code to meet our current needs. And, yeah. um, and it's, it's just, you know, we could talk until we were blue in the face about the, the, the code and how it's changed. But, you know, if you don't like it now, don't worry. Next week, it'll change again. You know, okay, don't worry. <laughs> that is not an official statement from the American Printing House of the Blind. <laughs> you do not need to worry. The code is not going to change next week. But in two weeks, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you see what I'm saying? It's, it's a yeah. living code. We, it's, it it, totally we adapt it to, to, to meet our current needs. And it's always going to change as we change, as the way we talk, the way we write changes. Yeah. And I know people have questions for you, but before we go there, um, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much, Daphne, and thank you, Mike. I just loved everything about this presentation. I, I know, um, like many people here today, I'm really looking forward to visiting one day uh, when we're able to do that. I love that you talked about the War of the Dots too, because that's certainly something that BLC has highlighted um, during the transition to UEB, that there was actually a time when people had to learn multiple codes and use multiple codes. And so, uh, you know, things continue to evolve along with the people who use, um, who use Braille. So thank Thank you so much.